We continue with our study of 2 Corinthians, and I have a lot to get to today, so I'm going to get right to it. True versus false apostles is the title. We will be going through 15 verses of chapter 11, and we will move the rest of chapter 11 to next week. Um, I didn't break that up uh, very well on the on the website, so if you're doing the following the study plan, you can still read through all of chapter 11, but just know that um, we're going to focus on the first 15 verses today. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> we are pummeled with information today, aren't we? Just pummeled with it. As followers of Christ, our job is to sift through the debris of information and discern what is right from what is wrong. Everyone should be doing that. But believers in Christ, followers of Christ, should really be doing this. This is something that's expected out of us. Sometimes we allow ourselves to become so inundated with garbage that it really clouds our judgment. That's the worst thing for us, I think. Every day as Christians, we face questions like, where do we draw the line for ourselves with how it might adversely or uh, positively affect our faith walk? That is this information that we're taking in. We might ask, and how exactly can we distinguish what's truth from false? From falsity. That's, that's at the top of our list, isn't it? The Word of God is our instruction manual, and the Holy Spirit is truly our compass. And if either are kept covered up, then we're lost. We need those in order to be able to discern through all the information. Today, I hope to help give you some direction with learning how to navigate between truth and lies. And not of the world, but inside the church. Okay? We don't care about the world. world. The world will always world. I'm talking about inside the church today. Let us approach this throne of grace by pleading to our intercessor, Jesus Christ, our Savior, in an appeal, in an appeal to God the Father to allow us to understand the Scripture today through the divine and blessed Spirit of God who goes before us and helps us understand His Word. Would you please join me in prayer? Gracious Lord, we, um, we're amazed at what you do. Through all the noise that we, we see around us, Lord God, there is just one real truth, and that is your scripture. But Lord God, even people have tried to use the pulpit to teach a false gospel, and many of us have been succumbed to that um, at some point in our life. And so we're still trying to unlearn lies and still trying to learn what the truth is. So we're going to pray, Lord, today that you would open our ears to hear, write your words upon our hearts, and allow us to, to truly hear something today that helps us from this day forward. That's what we really want to ask, Lord. It doesn't matter what we've learned or what we can still kind of struggle with in certain things. Let us just, just really begin to learn today. And I pray, Lord God, that I don't get in the way of your message going forward. In your precious holy name, Lord Jesus, I ask that you'd speak to your children by way of the Spirit through this unworthy vessel. And in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. As Paul continues this in the second letter of the church in Corinth, we get to a point in this letter where he actually sends shockwaves to the congregation. And he's frustrated with them because they're not listening to sound doctrinal teaching, sound instruction. He discovers that they're listening to false teachers. And, and this has been a catalyst for this entire letter. As we've talked about from time to time, especially at the beginning, his apology for not maybe hearing them, his struggle with them. It's all because he's, he, they, they, they've, they've really like launched this sort of little assault on Paul and he took it personally, but he realizes that it's a shot to him because it's really a shot to Christ. And so he's really writing this letter stating, you know, you shouldn't be listening to these people anyway. 
And before we read the passage today in our call to worship, I want to comment on a verse that Paul opens up with. He says, um, and we'll put it up here in a moment. I just want to kind of share something here with you, then we'll, we'll go to our actual passage. But he does open up with this line. He says, I wish you could bear with me in a little foolishness. And I really love it. But what does he mean by that? That's something that I really got hung up on uh, some time ago when I was reading this. And I was like, what does he mean by foolishness? Because he's really talking intensely here. Paul does not call the defense of his apostleship foolishness because it's dumb or stupid or nonsense. He calls it foolishness because he's doing it reluctantly, because he should be spending his time on more greater things. He shouldn't be wasting his efforts on, on talking to them about the, what he feels like is the obvious. Amen? You're going to see this here in a second, but I want you to think about how he's addressing this so that when we read it, you'll be like, oh, okay. Paul's not defending himself here when he go, opens this up in a moment because he, he, some sort of, he feels like he needs defending. He's defending his justification through Christ, explaining that he is speaking on behalf of Christ. Folks, you and I do not defend ourselves because we're defending ourselves. We're defending ourselves because we're representations of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's doing here. See, Paul could care less that they liked him. They liked these, these, these false apostles because they were maybe slick willies. Well, honestly, right? And, and they were good looking, maybe tall, and they spoke well. They didn't fumble all over their words like Pastor Patrick does at times. What he, what he wants, he doesn't care if they like him. What he wants them to care about are his words because he's a representative of Jesus Christ. And that he does it based on the authority in which Christ gave to him through the Spirit of God. He's doing all this because this is just how far these false teachers, false apostles, have infiltrated the church in Corinth. And this should serve as a reminder for all of us today that this is how far they will still try to infiltrate the church today. Please open your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you do not have your Bibles with you, you're always welcome to use the blue Bibles underneath the chairs. You just kind of got to fish them out a little bit, or they will be on the screen behind me, or for those of you watching at home or later, they'll be on the screen as well. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 15. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. What does betrothed mean? It means an engagement. It means an unbreakable engagement. So he's basically saying here that I presented you as the church, as the bride of Christ. It's beautiful how he words that. Okay, continuing 3 through 15. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning... Your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking... I am not so in knowledge, indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted, because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and I was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. The truth of Christ is in me. This boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. 
For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as an apostle of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. <laughs> Praise God for the reading of his word today. Oh, Brother Paul, the pen, <laughs> the pen in which you possessed the Holy Spirit that you allowed to write through you to actually write the words of the gospel which has been given to us today. Paul, the apostle, spares nothing here, and I love it. He's, bring, he's being honest. He's being forthright. And truthfully, he's saying exactly what the Spirit of God has laid upon his heart to write in the first place. He's tired of this church in Corinth getting duped by knuckleheads. Honestly. But they're more than just knuckleheads. Look at the final passage of what we read. Their end will correspond to their deeds. That's not a term of endearment, my friends. <laughs> That's a clear warning that their false gospel, one that isn't taught in God's word, will be met with judgment and the doom in which no true believer wants to endure, and we don't have to if we love Christ with all of our heart. Now, this, saints, is where we tend to ignore this section here, we tend to ignore the direct implications of the apostles' writings, because Think about this. We'll read through this and we'll think, and wow, well, Paul is just addressing the, the false teachers, false apostles of his time. We don't have to worry about that today. Saints, 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament address false teaching at some point. 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament touch on false teaching at some point. That's not by chance. This is a direct warning from the hand of God. This is so intentional by the authors of the New Testament, by the Holy Spirit writing, the, moving them to write according to what he's laid upon their hearts as the, his scribes are there so that we might have multiple reminders to what to be on the lookout for. And that's my job today. In a moment, I'm going to show you some of the most common traits of a false teacher, which is supported by uh, and given to us by Scripture. These are all warnings from Scripture. We will begin, however, by examining the pillars of our faith that are immovable. I want to show you the essential doctrines of understanding why you have a faith in Christ. These are uh, uh, not pliable. They are not compromisable. They, they have to be entrenched in us. Our understanding of our faith in Christ Jesus begin and end with these essential doctrines. Okay? Y'all got your eyes open and your thinking caps on this morning with me? Okay. Pillars of our faith. Monotheism. This is one God, three distinct persons. Okay, atheism, atheism means no God. Monotheism means one God. However, our God is in three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, a triune God of those three. Three persons, three co-equal, three co-eternal, one God. Kind of a trip. We've talked about this numerous times. We'll continue to touch base on this until it starts to really permeate us. Third one, Christ's virgin conception and birth. Immovable. Joseph was a step daddy, best step bonus daddy of all time, but he was not the father of Jesus. Jesus sinlessness, immovable. Christ never could have sinned. He could not have sinned in order to atone for our sin. Unmovable, immovable. Jesus atoning death or substitu substitutionary atonement, the cross. Immovable. He died on the cross. Christ's bodily resurrection has to be a pillar of our faith. I can make copies of this for you, by the way, if you can't keep up. I will send this to you through email if you need me to. I will text it to you. I actually will make, we're gonna make it on the website and we'll make copies of this. We should be handing this out daily. I don't know why we haven't done that so far. This is something I teach in like our foundations class 
and discipleship training, when we have our membership classes. Some of you haven't been through any of these yet, or maybe it's been a while since you have been. This is part of what we believe. I'm going to make this readily available. Stamp it on the walls, man. Christ's bodily ascension to heaven. Okay? His bodily ascension to heaven. Christ's intercession. He ascended to intercede for us. You have to understand that when you are praying, you are praying to Christ to get to the Father. Second coming of Christ. He will return. He has not returned yet. He will return. There are people who challenge this. Jesus is fully God and fully human. We know this as the deity of Christ. Um, This is the next one. And this is also what we call the hypostatic union. 100% God, 100% man. How can you be 200%? Jesus can. You cannot challenge the deity of Christ. This is the big one. This is where a lot of cults challenge this. They might agree on a lot of points, but they do not believe that Jesus Christ was fully God. This is an easy one to sniff out a cult. If you really challenge the Latter-day Saints, if you really challenge the the, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe the full deity of Jesus Christ. That's where you get them when they knock at your door. Human depravity. We are fallen. We are all dredged in sin because of the sin of the Garden of Eden of Adam and Eve. Human depravity. We are born into sin. That's a big one. The necessity of God's grace. We have to have God's grace. Immovable pillar. If you remove God's grace, it becomes your choosing of salvation. You had nothing to do with it. It is all God's grace. That's what makes it God's grace. You you thought all of a sudden that you love Jesus. Absolutely. Thank you, God, for revealing that to you and I. It is all the doing of the work of the Holy Spirit. We are told that over and over in the New Testament. This is a challenge all the time. Necessity of faith. There are religions that teach that you have to do works. Works, number one, grace, faith, second. No, works come as part of your faith. This church volunteers and does lots of stuff, works You know, rolls up their sleeves and works. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lays it on your heart to get off your duff and do the work of the kingdom. We're told that throughout Scripture. But faith is is necessity for you and I. Interpretation, final one I want to give to you today. Kind of put them all together. The inspiration, the inerrancy, and the sufficiency of Scripture. There's one other one that We could have put up there the method of interpretation, and I think that's really almost a core essential too. But I at least wanted to just get us on the point of inspiration. The inspiration of Scripture, it is inerrant and it's sufficient. This is immovable, okay? All right. These are pillars of Christendom, or what we call Christianity. They are immovable. Any attack upon these is the basic lesson to identify a falsity. Basic lesson to identify. Okay? Now, the church has always been under attack. The enemy hates our Savior. So if he can get one of his unbelievers to dress like one of us and introduce anything that goes against these pillars or tries to compromise it, then he does exactly what Jesus has explained to us during a Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to read only right now Matthew 7, 15, because later on we're going to read the entirety of that script at the end because Jesus tells you how to identify. But here's verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly are ravenous wolves. Have you ever truly thought about this passage of Scripture before now? I mean, you've heard it. I didn't ask you if you heard it before. I'm asking if you've truly ever thought about what Jesus is saying here. F- 
false prophets look like us, talk like us for a minute, kind of smell like us. Hopefully they smell good, but, <laughs> but inside are ravenous wolves. Well, what would a ravenous wolf look like? These ravenous wolves, no matter what they're fuel, are motivated by the flesh. They're motivated by something else. And that would be Satan. Amen, somebody. Satan is the great enemy of the church, and he never rests. He is always on the offensive. That's his job. And one of his chief weapons, one of his most successful weapons, is the false teacher. But it doesn't end at the, I should say, it doesn't end with the pulpit. It begins at the pulpit for Satan's workers. These kinds of wolves look like sheep, but they have specific traits, and you and I need to be aware of such traits. And sometimes they are um, members of the congregation too. So we have to be on the lookout for them. Let's go through these seven. Number one, the heretic. The heretic is the most prominent and perhaps the most dangerous of all the false teachers. He will deny those core fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith, which we went over. And he will, by, he will do so by challenging their importance. Um, he takes what God says is true, and he either outright denies it or plays fast and loose with the text. I once heard a very prominent false teacher that is still alive and well and Dreaming on today, who made its comment that he said, if we could just get people to all believe in God, there would be no need for a second coming. I, I don't know where he found that in the text, but that's plain fact. And that sounds decent to his congregation. Yes, if we could just get this place more Christianized, we wouldn't have to worry about the return. But if you're that, how, that is a sneaky way of denying the necessity of Christ returning. Well, what, we want everybody to become believers? That's a kind of a core desire of a lot of believers. But we know by what we see in their nasty fruit that a lot of people aren't going to be. And the word tells us that they're not going to be. We can't get hung up one way or another. We have to do what we're doing, amen, evangelizing and disciple-making those who do repent and believe. And then the core of all this is that at the center of it is you loving God. Don't worry about the world becoming more Christianized. That ain't going to happen. But you got to be focused on Christ and Christ alone. And your salvation, your faith walk, then the transition then helps you to be better at making sure that the rest of the New Testament is active in the community in which you live. Now let's look at the word of God here, 2 Peter 2.1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Interesting choice of words, bought them, because he bought you with the blood on the cross. He purchased you. You're a part of his elect. If you repent and believe in him, his blood paid your sin debt. He bought you. He bought you and your nastiness. That's what makes God's grace so magnificent. But the false prophets will try their best to sneak in and dupe us. It's kind of funny. If we call out the false teacher by their false teaching, there are many believers that get kind of unnerved by this. People don't like it when I name drop. Paul did it, but that's beside the point. When I name drop, and I'm not doing that today, I'm going to give you the pe- what you're looking for. You, you can go the rest today. But if I do name drop, I'll remind you that their demise, as said by Peter, brings swift destruction upon themselves. And this passage today from Paul, their end correspond with their needs. They're not being nice about the people who are trying to get you and I unraveled away from our faith walk. Satan hates you because you're made in the image of God. Keep that in mind. Number two, the charlatan. The false teacher in the church today, the second one I want to talk about is the charlatan. This person is only in it for themselves. They see Christianity as a means to personal gain like a business. They, uh, they see charlatans as people who, had, um, or they see Christians, I should say, 
as uh, people they can take advantage of in order to, to um, enrich themselves, in order to have more, in order to have a life of comfort, in order to have a life of, of wealth, no matter how much they get, no matter how much they take from other people, and, and they do this by convincing the sheep that they too might have something to gain if they too help them in living their lifestyle. Sound familiar? Yeah, it does. That's the charlatan. Comes from 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Look at that final line five. And constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Who do you think laughs at Christianity more? Then when they see the guys who are up there all about the prosperity, then the unbeliever. The unbelievers look at that and they can't believe that these people are fleecing God's flock. They laugh. And it falls in line with what he says, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Because they know that. And we should know that. But then we're trying to be like, well, we don't want to say anything bad about them because... Well, they're, they're probably Christians, true. No, they're not. And at some point, we have to stand our ground. Nowhere does the Bible teach us that we are to be wealthy and prosperous. Because, the, and it, all of that comes down to that health part of it too, man. And here's the thing about that prosperity gospel and the health and wealth doctrine. You think that, you know, you have more faith by the more you give. And let me tell you something. You're all proud of your health till you get cancer. And then your spouse watches you writher and die, and then they more mad at God because God didn't heal that person like they were supposed to according to that preacher, that charlatan. Amen? Number three, the divine, excuse me, the, the false prophet. The false prophet. This is a teacher who claims to bring fresh revelation. Fresh revelation in addition to Scripture. And they always do this in the name of God. So that you won't question it. Here's the difference between what God does through us and what the false prophet says. The believer, for the believer, the Holy Spirit will impress upon us things. All of a sudden, you'll feel like reaching out to somebody. All of a sudden, you'll feel like praying for somebody. Or all of a sudden, you'll feel like you need to do something. You ever get kicked like you need to do something? You know, you've got to be involved in this. you like, you have to go down and do this. And, and, and the Holy Spirit will move upon us. And, and these actions reflect what we find in Scripture. This doesn't make one a prophet. It doesn't make you a prophet for all of a sudden being right on point. That's the Spirit of God moving within the believers to enact his will being done. That's what the Spirit of God indwelling does for us. While the false prophet will get you and I to try to believe that they have some fresh revelation from God. This person will say, well, I, I can assure you that God has spoken to me. No, he didn't speak to them. All cults are founded and led by people who claim this. All cults are found and led by people who say that God has given them special revelation. Do a cult search on your own accord and read, you can even look at Wikipedia at this point and look at who, who founded it and what their claim was. Their claim was that God gave them additional revelation in addition to scripture. That's how we identify that. It's really easy pickets. We're just not sure. We don't know this, so this is why we're... Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Lord God, for giving us chapter 11. Amen? Many false prophets today also will move from church to church. They're traveling. They are coming to bless the congregation 
while others lead them directly into a mainstream of Christianity where they peddle their error. First John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Amen. The fourth kind of false teaching in the world today is the divider. This is one that was, I think is really interesting to talk about. The divider looks to implement division, and this is really something that I think we need to be really cognizant of. This person does not have to be at the pulpit. Generally, it can be. Let me explain. If it does occur at the pulpit, if it hits here, then it's meant to divide the church in an effort to destroy it. So that person who's teaching um, is implemented by the enemy to break up the congregation. So that definitely can be a possibility. But what if it's somebody sitting in a pew that wants to cause friction and gossip? And, and we've seen that in this church before. And they've caused trouble. And now I'm not saying that we haven't done our fair share as believers, true believers, falling victim and falling in line with gossiping. And that's something that we should be calling out ourselves on anyway. Amen. But there's somebody that will stick with it. They stay on it and they stick with it. And they don't ever show any remorse. They just keep driving this wedge between people, between Christians. They turn Christian against one another, maybe causing them to quarrel or fight over minor matters. As David always taught us, um, don't major in the minors. So when you see somebody doing this, you know, you, you, you know that they are, or they're just trying to get, there's a different agenda to what they have to say. The word of God tells us about them in Jude 18 and 19. Um, there is no chapter to Jude, by the way. Jude is just one chapter. So that's why it's just verse 18 and 19. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Devoid of the Spirit. They never have the Spirit of God in them. They look like sheep, but inside they are Ravenous. Don't forget that adjective. Ravenous wolves. The abuser. This is the teacher who only is trying to gain prominence, feed their ego. He may want a platform. He may want popularity. He may want to, to be known in the eyes of people. So he'll run over people to get there. The Bible actually speaks of this in, um, the, the, about the abuser. In Jude 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our, our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. The speculator. The sixth false teacher that I wanted to teach about today, I talk about today, is a speculator. And this can be a person who's academic, uh, who needs to come up with something um, novel in order to be heard in the field, within the field of academia. He may be an author, maybe a pastor, but likes to write books. Um, might just be an author who likes to go and do public speaking. Either way, and there's nothing wrong with pastors who do write. There are some really gifted ones. Uh, Sam Storms is one of my favorites. Um, Dr. Storms has an ability to teach, preach, and write um, eloquently and help explain the Word of God. R.C. Sproul did it. Um, MacArthur's done it. There's been a lot of really good ones. But there's a lot of bad ones, too. And, they have, and you look no further than what they're talking about. Now, those three that I just mentioned, they will write about a passage of Scripture or a theme of Scripture and help you see the, how it really can be put to use. And that's helpful. That's helpful. Because when we want to know, like, um, um, how to use spiritual gifts or, um, you know, uh, maybe spiritual, you know, understanding a better theme of, of spiritual warfare or 12 things God did with our sin or, or the, the grace of God, the mercy of God. These are good novel books that take a concept of theme and show you how God really uses this. So that when you read the word the next time you read that text or texts, you're blessed more by it than you ever were before because then you understand it has a deeper meaning. This is, this is common practice of reading scripture and learning it, right? Um, but people who go with the speculator, they take it to a different level. He takes something that is true and undermines it with something that could be true. 
was something that could be speculative, speculative, stupid word in the English language, something that is unimportant. Why I wrote that down and to use, I don't know. Um, this is very common, and they are all over the radio and sometimes on television too. Perhaps he's finding hidden codes um, and the letters and the words of the Bible. Perhaps he's, he's so obsessed with end times that he reads contemporary events into Scripture. Um, or he instills his take on heaven um, that isn't already found in Scripture. Or maybe writes a book about shock value in, in an effort to sell books. Whatever the case, the speculator is spoken about in Titus 3, in verse 3, 9. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. We want to, we want to learn the truth of Scripture by, and then the truth of theology by studying it and maybe reading somebody's take on a theological topic to help us. But going off, run rogue, and roughshod on different paths, it's, it's unnecessary. It's a waste of our time. I want to inter, uh, interject that also the discussion of interpretation of doctrine is really wildly important, and th that does not constitute a false teacher. We are told in the book of Proverbs that the iron sharpens iron, so we should be talking about different um, methods of interpretation, things like that. That's what makes, uh, it's, it keeps our minds focused on Scripture. Does that make sense? So I'm not, we can disagree sometimes on different things, but the one thing is for sure, can't move off of what is the pillar. And the final one I'm going to share with you this morning is the ear tickler. I know it's kind of a funny term, but the final false teacher we're going to examine today is, is the one who, who listens to what people want and gives, them, gives it to them. If a topic talks, of, if Scripture talks about something that is uncomfortable or unpopular to the modern culture, the ear tickler, tickler will, will actually shy away from, from the topic, and so he deals with what is popular instead. He'll avoid such tough scriptures and topics that talk about sexual morality or maybe homosexuality. He'll, he, he won't go to the point of talking about real dark sin or, or things like divinations. He'll avoid all of that, and he'll stay on point of things that are really positive, and he'll keep it, try to keep it positive. Look, man, your salvation is the most positive thing you'll ever hear about in your life. But we got, we're warned throughout the word to be careful of people who are trying to trick us off of the path. So we've got to talk about that stuff. Um, the ear tickler may um, speak all about heaven, but you can be rest assured he'll never speak about hell. He may speak all about the great benefits that come along with being a Christian, but rest assured, you know, he'll never be able to speak about, uh, speak about the sin problem that, that really uh, threatens us all. Brothers and sisters, you have a crown when you get to heaven, but you can't have that crown without a cross. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, to support this point of the ear tickler. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now, these are just seven. There are more. But in conclusion, I want to say this today. Remember that these people are Satan's great ambassadors. And, and they are in the world. They are not pimps or politicians. They are not power brokers. We definitely are not talking about figureheads and culture. We're talking about infiltrators of Christ's church. Don't lose sight of that. Again, if you're looking at what Kanye West says next to see whether or not he's actually a Christian. Amen. You're not getting the point today. You are going to be inundated with ridiculous information. And by the way, I want to say this to you. I, I've, I've met people over the years that would say things like, man, wouldn't it be awesome? Isn't it awesome that somebody like him, like Kanye West, for instance, sold millions of albums, produced millions more that have sold. You know, wouldn't it be great if he really was a strong Christian? And I said to people, I'm like, well, what difference does that make? They said, well, it really can really add some, some depth to the name of God. You could spread the name of the gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you that Jesus does not need help from any human being. He has the greatest name 
above all names. I could care less if anybody in the culture was saying something good about him on his account. I don't count on it ever happening because most of them are false. I worry about what this says. That's it. And I pray you consider the same. Now, I want to read to you that Matthew 17 passage in its entirety. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or, or, or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Thank you, Jesus. What more could we want? In conclusion today, it's very simple, you guys. Our great commandment is to love the Lord God with all of our heart, soul, strength, mind, everything we have. Love our neighbor, self-respect by loving ourselves. And the second thing that he really teaches us is the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of, uh, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I've instructed you. I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Great commandment, great commission. That's our job. We have to talk about these tough things because it helps us. But we can't get hung up on it. And I've, I've done a little bit of that before. I've, you know, it's no secret that I'm not a fan of Kenneth Copeland, Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, right? People like that. But those are also the easy pick and fruit. The other thing about this is that we also have to remember to keep it the unity of Christ, not ecumenically. I'm not talking about we're not joining forces with the Catholic Church. I'm talking about we keep the gospel, we love people through whatever they're going through, and we help them to see the real, true, biblical Jesus. And we have to have good conversations about it. Put your foot down where you have to put your foot down, but boy, you need to have your arms open to love these people through it. Amen? All right, let's pray today. Father God, thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for loving us through our our trouble. And thank you for showing us your truth. You are an amazing God. You bring us so much Um, uh, peace and contentment and, and, and love, Lord God, that may we turn around and love people the same. You know, we, it's easy to get frustrated at some of the things going on, Lord God. That's why you warned us that the love of many will grow cold. So we don't want to lose that love. We don't want to lose that love. But let us not compromise your gospel. And that's what we're asking for today. Discernment. How to, how to still know what's right and wrong, but never losing that edge of us that that is compassionate and loving towards others. Just help us bridge that gap. We ask you to help us with that. And say, oh, in your precious holy name that we ask these things. If anybody today, Lord God, has finally fell in love with you, has realized that they want to serve you with their whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, today is the first day of salvation, Lord God, and we praise you for that. And and if they have and if they have realized that something has changed within them, I want them to feel comfortable enough to come to me and um, or any of the elders, and we will pray with them and, and uh, welcome them into your kingdom, Lord Jesus. But we pray, God, that you would continue to do a mighty work through each and one of us, and it's all for your glory that we do these things. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.